Hello everyone, good evening everyone. Back in Brussels from the La Riccia Studios in Brussels. Happy to be here, happy to introduce to you one artist, two artists actually amazing that I've discovered that I want to... We are having trouble to uh, stream to Facebook. That's very good. Let me check if there is, can you give me a feedback in the comments, please? I can see that YouTube is working. But I don't know if Facebook is working, so please give me a comment if it works. I will go on Facebook. That's the nice things of being live streaming. I'm waiting for your reactions. Yeah, it doesn't work on, on Facebook. YouTube, it works, but not on Facebook. Mm -mm -mm. The thing is that I don't know what to do. That could be a problem with... problem on Facebook and actually so on YouTube it works but not on Facebook uh -huh. so what I'm gonna do I'm gonna take the link of YouTube I'm gonna put it on Facebook that's the only thing I can do right now Okay, sorry, never happened before. Um, it's a good stress to start with. <laughs> Back. We're gonna lose some some precious moments. That's it. Both on the your Facebook, check it on YouTube if Facebook doesn't work. It's not our fault. It happens. The post is there. Okay, so it cannot go worse than this. Welcome everyone. <laughs> Mira is supporting. <laughs> Thank you. So welcome everyone. And thanks for being here streaming or uh, how do I say with a, as a as a podcast. Um, I want to start with a short story. I was in Brussels in a concert in Ancien Belgique a few years ago, many years ago, actually 10 or 11 years ago. And I went to see a concert of uh, Noah Achinom Nini, but uh, Noam could not sing because she was without voice. So we were waiting and seeing what, what was happening that night. And suddenly on the scene, came to sing a singer, a beautiful singer that was looked like Johnny Mitchell, but she was singing in Arabic. So it was a very nice surprise. And after that concert, I learned that she was called Mira Wad and that she was having a project with a, a musical project with Noam, with Noah. And um, lately, actually it was in December, I saw the the video of them performing in uh, in Berlin, a song that I've already I've been talking about. There must be another way, and it was really a, a positive shock. So 
after the interview with Noah. I'm so glad, extremely glad to have here in Pausa Cafe in English tonight as well, Mira Awad. Good evening, Mira. Hello, how are you? <laughs> Fine. I, I, I hope I will be more relaxed now that the technology will, will help me. I, How is I it? Don't, I don't envy you on the technological front. <laughs> so you are my hero right now, for being able to deal with all this live. How are Listen, you, Giacomo? I'm fine. I'm fine. Yes, I'm happy to, to be here with you. I'm happy to have a chat with you because actually when we talked a few days ago to make a, you know the sound check and the video check, I told you that I, I didn't want to talk to you further because I wanted to keep the freshness of the of the questions and to right, uh, right, yes. have the 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 re reaction of your answers. So I would be uh, surprised at the question. I'm just kidding. I really don't know the questions. So, but yes. tell me, you are broadcasting from London, isn't it? Yes, I'm in my apartment in London. We moved here a year and a half ago. Yes. Okay. And how, how come, actually, the thing we have in common, the three of us, you, me, and the next guest that will come in half an hour, almost, that we come from sunny country, but we live in rainy countries. So true, yes. We, yes. Which is the reason that led you to, to Britain, to London? Actually, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to be so disappointing in this because I would have loved to have like a reason why I'm going to explore some... No, I'm here because of my husband. Okay. <laughs> It's a very boring answer. Okay. He got a, a chance for a wonderful job and we re relocated because of his job. And here we are uh, exploring London right now. Okay. And how do you like the city? How do you like London? I love London. I mean, I've always loved London. I never thought I was going to live here. But now that I do, I think I'm discovering even more charm. Uh -huh. There are many things that I love about this city. And I discovered that I do not mind the rain. Oh, uh, really? I do not <laughs> mind it. Like so, you. <laughs> you know, I meet I meet these uh, British people, you know, when I'm going into the gym or something. So somebody would come and hear, instead of saying like, buongiorno, buonasera, whatever, they speak about the weather, you know. So yeah. immediately they meet you in the elevator, they say... Oh, what a shitty they day, right? They yeah, they complain the about the weather. Yes, and, and I'm standing there, I'm like, eh, it's just a little bit of rain. It's not so mm -hmm. bad. And they go like, who are you? <laughs> but I mean, I, I can understand, but it's only one year and a half that you live there. Yes, that's So true. it could be that in the future, you will change. <laughs> At that the beginning, true. when you come from such a sunny country. And you... also, I come from a country that actually needs water. Needs so every water. time I see I see the rain, I'm going like, This is a blessing, you know, we, we cannot blame yeah, the you're rain. Right. You're right. Listen, Mira, you are a singer-songwriter, you are an actor, you are a TV host, you are a music producer, which and many other things, because actually only the introduction <laughs> could be very long. Which yeah. is your first love in your artistic life? That's it, because I cannot, I mean, if you are asking chronologically, I can answer that but I cannot answer which is my biggest love. So my first love, I think, was... You know what? It's even hard for me to, to really? answer that. I think my first love was words. Uh -huh. I so am a word person. Music, so... Uh, so words, that's it. So it's nice how you deducted that words, you know, they, they make up music as well because the way we speak and the languages. And I mean, I spoke three three languages until the age of four. Yeah. And the differences the, the differences between these three languages were, you know, was different music, different feelings, different vibes. We have, so, to, we have to mention which are those uh, those languages because people maybe that are listening to us, you don't know, because you, you were speaking at home, Arabic and Bulgarian. So actually, yeah, my first language was Bulgarian. Okay. My mother is Bulgarian and she came home with my dad to Israel. My dad is Palestinian from Israel, from the north of Israel. So in the beginning, she did not speak the languages, neither Hebrew nor Arabic. Okay. So we spoke Bulgarian at home. So that was the, the first language I, I spoke. And then I was put in a Hebrew speaking kindergarten. Okay. So unlike what people thought, I actually spoke Hebrew before Arabic. Okay. And after that, at the age of four or something, um, Before that, we moved to my dad's village, to the house that they were building, and we started speaking Arabic at home. So, And, and that village, languages. it was in the north, isn't it? Yes, it's in the Galilee. It's a Palestinian okay. village in the north of Israel. 
Okay. And when you moved to, I, I, I've read that you, you studied, you, you lived in Tel Aviv also a few years. When was yes. that? Before that, when I finished school, I moved to Haifa, actually. Haifa is a, a mixed city, an Arabic Jewish okay. city in, in, the, in, in the north of Israel, still considered the north. Uh, it has a beautiful bay area. And uh, it's on a mountain. Very, it resembles Beirut very much because it, the, the city itself is on the side of a mountain and it has the coast. Um, I mean, it's a so more, I, more relaxed city, isn't it? It, it's, it's, it has a, it's less hectic than Tel Aviv, for sure. Tel Aviv is very, very modern. And less very traumatic hectic. than Jerusalem. Oh, yes. Oh, yes. Less, <laughs> less historic. So Haifa has a very easygoing vibe. And I really love that city. I, I lived there for a few years while I studied fine arts in the university. And then I decided to study music, and that's why I moved to Tel Aviv. And then from there, it was a, a love story with Tel Aviv because I really loved living in that really? city. Yeah. But I've, I've read somewhere that at the beginning of your career, it was not working with music, so you decided to switch to acting. And that worked much faster, actually. Is it's it funny possible? that... It's funny that you put it that way because that sounds like a, like an actual decision that I made. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Nothing in that, in that sort. So I studied music. And while I was studying music, I was actually a wardrobe person at the theater. I worked mm -hmm. in, the, in the National Theater in Israel as a ward, wardrobe person while I was a student. And I thought actors were the craziest people I've ever met. So I was like, <laughs> did not think I was going to become an actor. But... When I finished my music school, I was offered an opportunity to participate in this musical okay. uh, theater play. And in the beginning, I went like, no, I'm no actor. And uh, the director, who was a friend of mine, the director and the composer of the, the piece, said, no, 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 you're going to be singing. You're not going to act to be acting. <laughs> yeah. So the bridge, course, the bridge was music. The anyway. bridge was music. But then I found myself doing monologues and I love it. And I loved it. Mm -hmm. And and. From there, it somehow took off, took off because people started inviting me for auditions to the theater. <laughs> okay. And I didn't have any theater training, but I loved it and I found it fascinated, fascinating, really. I think acting is the most fascinating thing. It's not the most fascinating, but it's one of the most fascinating things to do. Uh, so, so yeah, somehow my career rolled into acting, uh, but I always had the music going on and the music at some point took over. So it was always like this balancing okay, act between yeah. all the things that I love doing. Yes. But there was, if I, I don't know, I don't know exactly the date. There was a, a TV, a TV, I would say a series that made you really famous in Israel. If I, if I'm not wrong, yeah. it was Arab labor, isn't it? Yes. Yes. Can yes. you, can you tell us something about the importance of that series into the Israeli society? Yes. Yeah. Well, Arab Labor, first of all, was written by an amazing uh, Palestinian-Israeli writer, Sayyid Qashua, uh, who is a, it, it's about this, uh, the main character is kind of based on him, it's like this Arab, Arab journalist trying to fit in the Israeli mainstream, you know, in his career and his life, he wants to really fit in, but somehow, and this is the comic side of it, somehow he never does. Yeah. Uh, so it was a, a very good, well-written comedy, uh, tragic comedy. I always called it because, you know, when the, when a character really, really, really wants to fit in, it would do anything, but it doesn't. Uh, so it's in a, it's a, in a way it's tragic, but it's comic tragic. Uh, and I always felt like this was in the beginning. People also, I mean, some people in the Arab community, for example, criticized us for doing a comedy. Uh, and why do we need a comedy about the Arab citizens of Israel? You know, we're not yeah. enough have, has been done, so why a comedy? And I think comedy has, comedy is a great weapon, you know? Comedy is irresistible, and if it's really funny, if it works, it will enter the hearts of people, uh, and it will open a door. And I think Arab labor opened the door for other stories to come from within the Arab community in Israel, which is a minority, you know, we are 20% of the population not well represented on TV by then, by yeah. that time. Um, so we were like underrepresented in, in, in TV, especially in dramas or in stories or what have you. Uh, so it was a breakthrough in a way that we entered through the door of comedy and started telling these stories about the Arabic community of Israel. And I think uh, later on... Uh, and the, 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 the series was in 
uh, in uh, um, Hebrew and Arabic together. Yes, exactly. So, so we also brought the Arabic language, of course. So these characters were speaking their own language, uh, you know, showing us, uh, opening a door for us to see uh, the Arab community, how it lives, how, uh, you know, uh, on all its diversity, the more uh, the more liberal part, the more uh, preserved part. So it, it showed all these characters that the Israeli TV has not really seen before. So it really opened the door. And years later, I wrote my own TV drama yeah. that Muna. time. And uh, Muna, exactly. So I, I created a TV drama. And I always say, and I really believe it from all my heart, if there wasn't Arab labor, there wouldn't be Muna. Yeah. Arab labor opened the door for me and other people like me to do more things about the Arabic community in Israel. So for me to bring a story about a female lead character for the first time in the history of Israel, a female Arab lead character on in a drama series uh, on main, mainstream TV, uh, that history had to have, you know, a, the door open for it. And Arab yeah. labor was it one was of the door door. openers. Yes. Yeah. You were talking about theater before that. I'm going to show you a picture right now and you're going to tell me what is that. You're going to tell us. What is that about? Okay, okay, let's, let's see. Oh, la casa degli spiriti. Okay, we're gonna switch to Italian. No, okay. <laughs> okay, no problem. <laughs> go oh ahead, my go god! Ahead. Oh my god! Okay, this is a production that I hold so dearly in my heart. Really, uh, yes. Look at us, such a wonderful cast, and and uh, and and who have become. Look at us, how many we are. You see, this is mostly Italian cast. Uh -huh. um, but we, but some Israeli actors and me, the Palestinian, uh -huh. uh, joined them and we did this production. It was a four hour uh, play in Italian. We started La in Casa Rome, degli Spiriti. La Casa yes. degli Spiriti, in Teatro dell'Orologio in Roma. Um, and uh, it was my first experience in Italian for sure. Um, I did not know what I was going into. In the beginning, I learned my text like a like, you know, like a parrot, just repeating yeah. things phonetically. And little by little, I really insisted to understand what I was saying. And I ended up really learning a lot of Italian and a lot about Italy. And I really, this is so close to my heart. And I'm playing the the, the role of Clara. I, I don't know if you know the book. The book is such an amazing book, uh, The House of Spirits. If you haven't read it by Isabella Allende, I really recommend this. It's a, it's a feminine saga about mm -hmm. like three generations of women in Chile in the time of the revolution, the military takeover and, and all that drama. And it's just a wonderful story, wonderful story. I read the book. I remember when I reading when I read the book, I was I was so afraid it was going to end. You know, these books that you're seeing how the pages are ending and you go, no, no. But what am I going to do with the rest of my life if I'm not reading this book? And then I got the chance to play Clara, but uh, the directors, uh, Glenda and Claudia, Claudia de la Seta, who is uh, Italian, married to an Israeli, that's how I got into the play. Uh, they did this amazing trick where they divided Clara into three, act three actresses. One actress plays her as a girl, then I played her as the woman with all the pregnancies and the, and, you know, the, the womanhood, and then another actress playing the old Clara. And it, it was... It's really one of the most amazing experiences for me in theater. And it went um, on for 20 years, apparently. Yes, yes, yes. We kept somehow managing to put it back together. Like every year, every two years, we would find, Claudia and Glenda would find, somehow would find the the, the money and, and they would bring us back. And sometimes with people, you know, changing, substituting, but somehow we kept bringing it back. And it's really... Um, a part of my life, you know, a very significant part of my life. Amazing. And also Amazing. it introduced me to Italy <laughs> in, the, in the most great, you, in greatest way. You were way. performing <laughs> from north to south. To, yes, yes. South Amazing, everywhere. amazing. Yeah, yeah. That was a really great experience. And tell me, what about this picture? I think it's important to oh, talk about that. My sister. <laughs> tell us. Seriously, what... this is my sister, you know. This is such a, a long relationship now. Uh when it started? It started, oh God, my God, it's it was 2000, 2001. It was, um, 
So long before the Fair. Eurovision. Oh, long before. Yeah, yeah, yeah. When we got to Eurovision, we had been working together for nine years already or something. So yeah, it okay. should have been 2000. I was doing... I was doing theater at the time. I was doing uh, My Fair Lady. I was doing Eliza Doolittle in My yeah. Fair Lady at mm -hmm. the Opera House. That was the what I was doing at the time. And Achinoam, Noah, and Gili Dor were looking for a singer to, to, do, a, to do a duet with. They wanted mm -hmm. to do We Can Work It Out, the Beatles song. Yeah. And they were looking for a partner. And uh, one day, Gili Dor, yeah, that's him on guitar, he saw me on TV talking about My Fair Lady. I was on a, on a TV show hosted by Yair Lapid, who later became a prime minister for five minutes. Uh, but he was a TV host oh, back yeah. then. Yeah, yeah, he's a minister. <laughs> he was like, he's the head of, uh, of the... Uh... Yeah, yeah, no, you said five minutes, like, I mean, because it yeah. was one year or six yeah, months. Yeah, five or minutes, even, whatever. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> but yeah, uh, from a TV host, he became prime minister. So... Uh, so I was on his talk show and Gilly saw me there and they decided that we have to meet and maybe we're a fit. And they came to my little apartment in Tel Aviv and we clicked on the spot. Okay. But you know what started out as a very professional kind of partnership where we really, um, we recorded that song and we started performing a lot together. And then I invited Noah to record a song that I wrote, a word and then we did some duets together and then the Eurovision and a lot of things. But what started as a professional uh, duo in a way became like really the greatest friendships that I have because this only deepened with time. Uh, and, and what we went through, you know, in these 23 years now is, is quite remarkable when you, when you think of a two independent artistic women with a lot to say, <laughs> both of us with a lot to say. Was it, and, um, was it the beginning of your, uh, what, how you call it, artivism? Yeah, or it I was, mean... It, 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 or it was dated from before? Yeah, I've always been an artivist. So I've always done a lot of things uh, using my art or, or my platforms. Maybe not my art, but the platform I was given to convey messages that I believe in and, and to back, in, you know, to advocate for agendas that I believe in. But I think this was bringing it to a higher level of a platform. Mm -hmm. when, when, we, when we went to Eurovision and 40 million people watched our song that was talking about, you know, um, when I cry, I cry for both of us. When we are sharing our pain and we're talking about pain, we're, just, we're not singing like, Oh, so happy we're together. No, we're talking about the, sh the the pain and the need to share that pain. I think that's like uh that's taking it to a very very bigger, different level. Yeah, on that on that stage in Germany, in Berlin, you also oh the one you just uh, broadcasted yeah, exactly. in Berlin, yeah. Uh, you sang "There Must Be Another Way," and it was a more sad uh, version of the yeah. of the pop song of the. Of the Eurovision, and then you sang another beautiful song that in Arabic and in English. And I'm showing right now the video clip. Ah, uh, yes. Think um, of others. Think of others. There is actually a poetry. It is not your words. The right. lyrics are not yours. Yes. They are of Mahmoud Darwish. Mahmoud Darwish, yeah. And you you transform that poetry into 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 a song. And now we're gonna see few people that are uh, that are accepted to participate with you uh, to this video clip for the song yeah. in English that it's really beautiful for all those that are listening that will listen in the future please go and check this video clip check the tune because it's really amazing. yeah this is a think of others solidarity project so uh, as you can see there are many artists par participating here uh, both Palestinian and Israeli and uh, it was a tough project to make but I couldn't be prouder today that we made this. this Why like, was it tough? Because even then, even before, I mean, I know people were so immersed in what's happening right now that we forget that we always had trouble in our region, right? History, our history did not start on October 7th. And we always had tensions and um, ups conflict and downs. And yeah, and conflict, exactly. So even back then when we did this song, uh, a lot of artists kind of shied away from participating in a project that is about solidarity. 
So I would call people and say, listen, I'm recording this song. It's a Mahmoud Darwish poem. So first of all, some people had a problem with that. Uh, that he's Palestinian and he's, uh, you know, the national one, Palestinian one the, poet. The founder of the PLO as well. Exactly. Uh, so some people had a problem with that. Okay. Yeah. But some people wanted to participate but were worried what will their audience think if they are working, if they're Jewish, if they're working with Arab uh, singers and if they're Arab, if they're, you know, collaborating with Jewish artists because they were worried that their audiences maybe will not approve. So... It wasn't easy, and these people are my heroes, the ones who did come, you know, come along and, and participated in this. Because apparently, um, solidarity is a bad word. <laughs> I did not know. In the artistic apparently. field, there is a, a big gap between Arab artists and uh, Jewish artists in Israel. <sighs> Listen, uh, there's a, there is a problem. <laughs> There is a gap and there is a, a difficulty and there is a lot of stigmas and a lot of fear to mm. be stigmatized as something. So for Palestinians, it's always been complex to be collaborating with Israelis because they would be accused of normalizing uh, an abnormal situation where there's occupation and there's discrimination and there's a lot of trouble. And if we are collaborating with Israelis, then in a way we are normalizing that situation. So some people would criticize it for that. I always held the opinion that when I'm working with uh, Israelis, we are working together to change uh, the polarization and to bridge the gaps. But some people can, you know, uh, interpret it differently. It was and the same Israelis, critics that were done for your participation to the to the Eurovision, isn't it? Yes, for sure. And you know, I and I and I understand everyone's uh, comment. You know, it's like you, everybody's entitled to think the way they want about how we're supposed to be facing this really, really, really very complex situation. Nobody's denying that it's very complicated. We're just maybe not agreeing on how we're supposed to be dealing with it. I've always taken the path of opening up uh, windows and doors for people to communicate and have and have a dialogue, because I think only when we get to know each other and have a, a sincere dialogue that we can actually change reality. If I shut my windows and I shut my doors to you, I will never meet you and I will never get to know you and I will not know your story and I will not know your narrative and yeah. and and I will always be afraid of you. So my path was always to open up. Yeah, there is something that I want to show you right now, let you hear. Okay. It's a meds message from an artist that he says, I think it has a, he has a similar approach. So check this. I hope the volume will work. You will recognize him immediately. Marhaba. Hi. Assalamu alaikum. <laughs> um, I, ho I hope my message will find you safe. Marhaba, Mira. I'm Anwar, aka Anwar. Um... I know this amazing person, amazing. It's, it's, I'm like, I'm feeling so proud that I know Mira in personal. We met almost 20 years ago when I was still young, a kid. And we even performed one of my first songs I ever released. It's called Anna Bahibbet, I Love You. And it was a privilege and an honor to perform with Mira. Every time we perform, but specifically that, Back then, it was my first shows when I started to perform, and she gave me so much self-esteem, and she taught me a lot of things. So I want to thank you for that, for all the conversations, even when I have problems with women. <laughs> oh my God, Sam! If if anyone here does not know this artist, please go and check him out. Sam says the quote. He is. Phenomenal, and I'm proud of myself that I recognized it back then. I kind of I saw this kid. He was a kid. He was like a real. He was a kid, and I saw this kid. And I said, "This is this is one hell of a talented kid. He's a rapper, singer. He's so musical. He's so curious. He always wanted to learn. He still wants to learn. And I and I have that thing that I want to help people like that. You know, young people that are curious and want to learn." And yeah, yeah, I performed with him his song back then. Oh my god, and, so and cute! I want to, because he, he has a project that is called the uh, Dugri Project. Dugri Project, they're amazing. Check yeah. them out, please. They are doing amazing work. 
Yes, it, it's a yeah. It's one a, of them is Arab Jewish. Rapper, uh, Uriah, and exactly, a Jewish. exactly. A Jewish rapper, Uriah, and and Samah, the Arab, and they bring the narratives. Together, the narrative without amazing. any without any discount, I would say. Italian, no without, filters, exactly. no filters, and it's amazing, yeah. and it works. And you can see that these two narratives are they can be tough, but there's a way for us to to bring them together into the room, and you know, and 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 somehow live with them. Amazing. I'm glad. That That's I a nice surprise, Dr. Oh, nice yeah. Thank you. I want to show you a few other pictures because before we introduce the uh, the other uh, amazing guest of tonight. So I think this one, uh, I think uh, this is the guitar player you, you are working yes. with since Shai many Alon. years, isn't it? Yes. Exactly. Shai Alon. Shai Alon is like my brother, you know. Again, it's a, like a musical journey that starts for work because I called him one day and said, Shai, I need you. I need a guitarist. You have to fill in for another person who couldn't come to tour with me. And I remembered him from another project we did somehow in theater. He played in the band in a musical that I was participating in. We had we clicked, we became friends, but we never really worked together. And then I really needed a guitarist and I called him from the from the US saying, Shai, I have these dates in Spain in May. Exactly. Can you do it? And he jumped on on the boat. And since then, he he's, he just became my brother. And his sense of humor of this person is unlike anyone really? else in the way. Yes, he's <laughs> the funniest man on earth. I always want to put a microphone for him to speak in the shows, and he always refuses. And I'm like, man, <laughs> you're depriving the world of your talent. <laughs> he's so funny. So funny. Okay, let's go. Wow, oh. look at that. Bob Marley. Yeah, Bob, Bob McFerrin. Bobby McFerrin. Yes. Could be Bob Marley. <laughs> no. Yeah, no. Just How did you two time. guys met? Oh, Bobby McFerrin had uh, a series of shows in Tel Aviv. Uh -huh. And he invited a lot of Israeli uh, artists to perform with him. Also, Noah. Uh, she was on a different date. She was on, a, I think, one day before me or after me. But uh, he, they invited a lot of musicians. And, and the stages were filled with these amazing people and each one of us had his turn you know to come on and and, and sing with bobby and uh, it, it was a it was an out of this world experience yeah <laughs> because i grew up on him like all of us right it's like, yes. like bobby mcferrin it's crazy and there amazing. i am I'm, and and then i was we were improvising of course because everything is improvised and yeah. at some point i took out a nay you know i am um, I don't know if you know this, but uh, I I play all sorts of very weird stuff in my shows. Like I play this concha shell, and I, if you give yeah, me yeah, a yeah. if shell, you give yeah. me a, a a broomstick, I'm gonna play. If it if it has a, a void inside, I'm gonna play with it. So the thing yeah. is, I have this trick. I sing into stuff, and then it makes this very weird effect. So I, I brought this you. thing. And, and, and I and I improvise also with that nay. I was like, "What? What is she doing?" I really liked it, so it was nice. Really, and what really do you tell me about this one? Oh, Caetano and Jean. Oh, Caetano and Jean. Oh my God! Yes, this was. They visited Israel, mm -hmm. and there was this uh, event um, by uh, the. I think it was the Israeli, uh, the New Israel Fund. Um, it's for shared living and an equal society and they and and we met at that event and then i, I went to the concert now okay they did a tour in israel and they met people in israel and palestinians and israelis and heard a lot of stories and i felt like i'm i have to say that i have a, a bittersweet memory here because i really loved meeting them and i uh, shared amazing moments uh, with Caetano, even uh, uh, dedicated then his song, um, uh, because I said to him that one of my favorite Brazilian uh, Portuguese words is people. People. people yeah. I love the word. And then he dedicated because he has a song like that. Nas and, in Arabic. Yeah. Isn't it? Nas, exactly. Nas, people. And I love the sound of it. It's like a beautiful word. <laughs> um, but actually, why I'm saying it's a it's a it's a bittersweet moment because when they left, I think um, 
there was a change in the atmosphere for them about Israel and about wanting to come to Israel again. I'm not advocating for Israel here right now, but I'm saying I think in order to build bridges, you you shouldn't boycott, you know, and you should you should be able to come to the place and try to advocate for the bridge. Uh, it's very hard to advocate for bridges when you boycott places and, and people. So um, it's kind of changed the vibe. Their, mm -hmm. their vibe changed after that. But I understand it as well, of course. There's no... So I'm going to show two comments before passing to the next, next sex session. Sending love from Denver. Hello, mm. Jan. And then I've got Mira, you're wonderful. A big fan. Oh, thank you. Great. And, okay, a few, uh, few weeks ago when we started talking, I, I wanted to... Um, to enrich this uh, episode of Pausa Cafe with another guest, as I did in other, in other um, episodes. So we were thinking who uh, would be the right person to call. So I was watching your videos, I was trying to get inspiration, and then immediately there was a, you know, like a, uh, I was enlightened. And I saw a video of you with Tom Cohen. I said, yes, yes this is the link. And actually, <laughs> it was just because you and Tom Cohen that we are going to introduce in two seconds. You have been working together. But uh, uh, with the days, I, I was thinking about you too. And I was thinking that somehow you are uh, two sides of, of the same coin. You do two things from the from two different parts of the Israeli society, but trying to uh, construct, uh, to build bridges uh, towards the other community. You are yeah. um, Palestinian, you sing in Arabic, and you use Western harmony. He conducts uh, an orchestra, a big and important orchestra, mixing up uh, uh, East and Western, uh, Eastern and Western yes. music. So with a lot of pleasure from Brussels, very Ooh. close to me, I have the pleasure to invite here in Pausa Cafe, Tom Cohen. Yay. Good evening. Hey. 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 Mira, you are wonderful. I'm a huge fan. <laughs> <laughs> Was that you, Tom? <laughs> <laughs> Bye, so good to see you. It's so good to see you. And hi, Jacko. Thank you for Hello. having me. Hello, it's a pleasure. I was saying before, maybe you were not there, that we are maybe the only thing we have in common, the three of us, is that we, we come from hot countries and we live in rainy countries. So <laughs> Tom, how, how are you dealing with Belgian rain? There are a few things that I think I would never get used to. It doesn't okay. matter how many years I would live here. And the rain. rain is one of them. The rain is one of them. The grayness is uh, is uh, I I I cannot wake up in the morning and the sun hasn't risen yet. That's 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 mm. horrible. Right. Yeah, depends at what time now. Actually, I don't know how it is in London, but now at eight o'clock when I take my kids to school, there are some lights of sun. No, I come on, it, it, it's, we have it's, sun. It's, it's fine. <laughs> <laughs> I can't it's really. Fine. I can't complain. I don't so, hate the weather. <laughs> Tom, do you want to tell us how you two met? What have you been doing together? How is your with, connection? With uh, well, to be honest, I don't know if I ever uh, told Mira that, but the first time that I uh, got to know Mira was a lot before we actually were introduced. Um, I, was going, I was driving my car. I was, I don't remember how young I was. Uh, I was driving in my car, I think after a concert, and I was listening to a, an interview with the singer that sings uh, uh, Liza Doolittle uh, <laughs> in that musical. And, uh, and she was also playing uh, pieces from her album called uh, Bahaluan that she yeah. took out at the same time. And I remember loving the music and trying to remember, you know, it wasn't like today when you just look it up on Spotify. <laughs> These were different days. You were driving your car and listening to the radio. You needed to remember the name of the person. Exactly. <laughs> so we, 
by any chance you would see a CD or something, you would uh, buy it. And then, and then actually a few years later, uh, when my orchestra did an album with uh, David Broza, okay. uh, right. it, was, it was all a, a, a cover album, David Broza covering himself <laughs> in new versions for his songs. Of his songs, <laughs> yeah. Uh, uh, reinterpreted in the in the east and west language that we've developed in in Jerusalem, and uh, and uh, one of the songs that we did was uh, Belibi, a song that uh, David originally sang uh, uh, with Palestinians from uh, East Jerusalem, and uh, we did a version of it uh, together with Mira, a duet with Mira, and uh, with the choir of uh, Israeli and Palestinian kids from the YMCA in Jerusalem. Uh, and it was actually a very nice. Uh, it, it was it was a, a a charming experience to to work with Mira. At the time, she came very open, and she was like, she was she had exactly the right amount of sugar for for this kind of we are the world. Uh, 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 <laughs> And at the same time, and at the same time, she's just enough aware to to keep you like you 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 enjoy this. Uh, you have this guilty pleasure of going with her on on this journey, and and I, and I really remember, I really cherish that experience in the studio with her. So another few years passed, and uh, with my orchestra, I wanted to do a homage project uh, for the great Lebanese diva Feirouz. And uh, and for me, Feirouz had these two faces uh, that were that were very uh, uh, that made her basically what she is. She was a great Arabic traditional singer. She held the maqam in her throat. She 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 really carried traditions of 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 ancient uh, like of, of of thousands of years. And at the same time, she had the modernity and she had this. Yeah understanding of the West and and of of communicating with its sounds and so I brought basically two figures uh, into the concert uh, one of them was amazing singer called the uh, Riham Hamadi uh, and and to, to, to bring more the traditional face and then for me and I didn't know actually if she would go for it or not but I really wanted Mira to to come and represent the other part and help me push it as much as much as we can towards uh, towards uh, exaggerating this side using Mira's abilities. And when I called her to ask her if she wants to do it, she said, Tom, I have one condition. And I told her what? She told me, I'm only doing it if we are going to push the boundaries of this thing as much as we can, which was exactly the thing exactly that I your was idea. And and uh, and I actually this concert is still online until this day. Yes. You can see on YouTube. The, uh, all of the songs we were hosting a, a great pianist called uh, Guy Mintus that I know yes. that later uh, toured quite a bit with uh, Mira and Yeah, Elbe. later we worked together a lot. Yeah, yeah, yes. And uh, so so eventually, Giacomo, it's all about people loving other people. Oh, yeah. <laughs> Absolutely. So true. No, it, Listen, it is. If you haven't seen Tom uh, leading an orchestra, you have not seen anything in your life. <laughs> this is the sexiest being in the world when he's there and he's doing his thing. It's the sexiest thing you've ever seen. I'm telling you. So, because Tom is the founder and the director, composer, arranger, mainly of the Jerusalem Orchestra East and West that is now scrolling. Beside, but he had, he had a lot of project together with uh, uh, Moroccan uh, orchestras and Turkish orchestra and Canadian and Belgian orchestra. So basically, he's one of probably the the, the, uh, the director that try to fusion together Eastern music and Western music. And I want to show Tom, if you allow, just the the screenshot of your of your main project, Jerusalem yeah. Orchestra, East and West. So everyone, please go and visit that. And there is plenty of uh, videos on YouTube because you yeah, they're, collaborate they're with a lot of people. 
They're a great orchestra, by the way, and a lot of fun to work with. Really, all the people there are amazing. So heartwarming. There yeah. are. So yeah. Western instrument and Eastern instrument, which yeah. is the proportion? The, the, the composition of the orchestra is actually quite unique. And so it's, it's, uh, so it's the, the characters that, that uh, make it. And, um, and I think that makes it, that, that's like both on the philosophical, but also on the professional level, the fact that everybody in the orchestra can be whatever he can, can consider himself whatever he wants to be, as long as he's contributing his role and he's not harming anybody else both on the musical level and, and on the personal level, it creates this uh, very unique and very flexible body that is able to do a very wide range of, of musical genres because basically it's a chamber orchestra. So you have the, all the string sections, like six first violin, six second violin, four violas, four cellos, a double bass. Then you have a small, let's call it a brass section, like in uh, the more... Uh, uh, Broadway. American, uh, American uh, 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 orchestra, so you have the saxophone, trombone, and the trumpet. Then you have a rhythm section in the back that is composed for, both from a drum set and an electric guitar and a yeah. bass guitar, but also from Arabic percussions. And in the front, you have four, uh, sometimes more, it depends on the project, but uh, uh, at least four musicians playing uh, classical Arabic instruments, uh, the Arabic violin, the ney flute, mm -hmm the Oud and the Kanun. So the orchestra can basically do anything from disco to Um Kaltum <laughs> and sometimes even mix it in all yeah. kinds of... <laughs> but the term Levant music, was it you that invented it? Or it it's was actually... Already... It's actually, it's, um, it was, the, I, I was working, we had uh, with the orchestra our uh, Barbican uh, premiere last February, uh, which seems somehow like, uh, it's a year ago, but it seems like 200 years ago. Mm. Uh, and for that project, we worked uh, with a great uh, PR person uh, from the UK called Simon Miller. And uh, Simon was talking about the musical language uh, that we've developed in the orchestra, this language that, that combines the, 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 the jewels that we get from the world of, of, of Makam and, and Arabic music and combine it with the beautiful structures of, of Western harmony and, and uh, these grooves meeting these grooves and this kind of syncopation meets this kind of syncopation. So, so for him, he, he named it Levant music because uh, both because it represents the region, the Levant region, because it, it, it embodies this, this uh, um, cons concept of, of, uh, of the Levantine people that we aspire to be. Yeah. And, uh, and because uh, Levant means to elevate. So in a way, You're it's right. another floor. It's another going floor. up, going up, going yeah, towards. Not, not a, a revolution it's rather another part of an evolution yeah. so i liked i liked it very much so since then uh, i i've adopted uh, the term the levant music yeah. Yeah, yeah and guys how it is to be an artist in these days of conflict <sighs> what can you tell me what, what what was i mean mira said that i mean the it's a conflict that go, goes on from a long time, but in the recent months, anyway, it has made a step further that is very different from everything that we have seen before. So how do you leave that? that is, does it affect you? Does it push pushes you more to in the direction of communicating with the other communities? How are you leaving that? Who wants to start? To put the... <laughs> well... Listen, it's, it, this is a very, very, very painful time for everyone. And um, naturally, as I said, I mean, for context-wise, of course, the conflict has been around for a long time. But of course, on, on October 7th, we were all shocked with, um, with, with the atrocities that we witnessed and, uh, and everything that it brought after that. Yeah. Um, I'm fearing that something with the fabric of, of 
you know, of the whole region, but especially within Israel, because also you have to rem you have to remember that within Israel, the twenty percent of the population is Arab Palestinian, um, native Palestinian. So these people who have shown the utmost solidarity with the, with Israeli citizens suffering from atrocities on October seventh. And opened their homes and 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 participated in 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 campaigns to help host and and fund and 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 recover um, people from the south of Israel. Later on, as the weeks go by, they are also feeling the pain and the loss that is going on in Gaza. A lot of a lot of people in a, a lot of Arab Israelis have families and acquaintances and colleagues in in the west bank and and in gaza and to see that and feel that it's not it's not being told enough it is not being narrated enough for the average israeli it almost doesn't exist the stories that are happening in gaza and the west bank right now because understandably the average israeli is occupied with his own pain which is an immense pain and i understand the pain um, so we are we are standing in a very very critical time of polarization where I'm quite worried for the inner fabric of society in Israel, but of course for the whole region because if we continue like this, we're only going to see more and more escalations and more and more incidents like that because war does not bring peace. War brings more devastation and brings you said, more. You said once something that can be very. Uh, it looks very simple, but it's so true uh, that the mm, peace activists often are called naive. Yeah. But peace, it's the only possibility that yeah. we have. There is nothing else. Nothing. Because you... Yeah, please when, go when, on. When, when you look at what is the alternative to peace, the alternative to peace is what we're seeing right now. Is these escalations happening. And, you know, so now uh, there's devastation in Gaza, but, you know... Uh, after year two, people have no reason to, people have no reason to love Israelis right now, and and the hate is only building up, and yeah. and and so we are creating a, a reality that's only going to come back at us with more hate and more animosity and more this. So I'm saying we've tried this already. We've have been doing this for a long time now. We see the results. These are results of negligence and of managing a conflict. No, we want to end the conflict. We want to reach a resolution, and if we don't, we're only going to be managing the next conflict. I don't want to be managing the next conflict. I want to look forward in hope that the kids and the grandchildren are going to be living in a different kind of uh, of reality. So yeah, when people tell me you're so naive, I am I the naive? It's naive to think that we we should be doing the same things and expecting different results. That's naive. It's not naive yeah. to think that we have to change something fundamental in our understanding and in our narratives, in our inner narratives, to see that we have to change something very fundamental in the way that we are managing our lives in that region. And you two guys, you're living uh, this situation very personally, but you live abroad. You live in Europe, in Belgium, yeah. in England, and I'm suffering very much in... Uh, when I see how in, in the in Brussels, for example, or in Italy as well, the situation is understood and lived because it looks like it's a football game where you have to take a flag yeah. and you have to say only those words. You cannot uh, you cannot make an effort to understand the complexity the complexity because that's your team so you cannot be on the you yeah. can understand the other one how do you leave that situation i don't know if you uh, if you uh, um, if you uh, how do you say reflect me if you if you think the same that, uh, as i do how do you how do you feel living uh, in europe in these times uh, uh, tom, tom do you want to take this or it is it is um it is a very lonely place at the end of the day to be um, holding the opinion or trying to hold the opinion that sees the humanity and the suffering in any situation and at the same time knowing and I guess 
Mira and I differ in this experience, and I cannot say which one is more complicated. Uh, but at the same time, knowing that when you talk about these two teams, that for the men from the street that will talk with the, my barber that will talk with me about the war, uh, for them these are just two teams that maybe he feels that he needs to choose a side, but I am born into one of the teams. Yeah. By definition, this is my team. And it is hard to be able to hold a complex uh, way of seeing things without getting into this... Black and uh, white. Uh, not, not only black or white, but this uh, this uh, um, never-ending uh, condemning game. I condemn yeah. this and I condemn this as well, and I condemn this because we condemn constantly because because everything that is happening doesn't make sense on a human on a basic human level, and and especially for me, I mean, I used to see it as. I'm trying to be safe and I'm trying to remember not only my personal views, but also the position that I hold and the families that I have responsibility for uh, uh, providing. Uh, but at the same time, I understood that it's not only this. I constantly try, because of my unique positioning, to try and keep my channels open with a, as much people on the Israeli side as possible. And obviously uh, on, on the Palestinian side, but, but it's, a different, it's a completely different question. I'm, 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 my voice is, is not relevant, I guess, uh, at this moment uh, in any way in the Palestinian side. Uh, all I'm saying is that I try, and most of the times it's not enough, but it's what I can do to create these little bridges. Little like, bridges. Like making this project of Fairuz, reminding people that Arabic is also their language and the language of their ancestors, reminding them that these people that grew up in the countries that today we are in a conflict with, they admire or used to admire, or that these people are a big part of their cultural DNA, yeah. that in a way, I don't think it has any real value uh, when, you, when you compare it to to this war, the atrocities that it's bringing us since, I mean, specifically talking about this point in time, since the 7th of October and all the way up till now, uh, but, but, uh, but it's still the little that I can do, you know? And which is the feeling that you have during your concerts where you, where you mix this Eastern music and Western music from the public right now in Israel? How is the, the reaction that you have when you introduce Arabic instruments or uh, Arabic singers? I think, I think that in general, um, when it's not in a, any context that might disturb or preoccupy the listener, Music is still kept in Israel as uh, something that is outside of the... I mean, people don't conceive not the Arabic language, neither the Arabic instruments, as something that offends them. I saw this when, when in the first months, uh, my orchestra, I mean, the, the concert world was cancelled completely. And in order to not uh, send uh, my, my employees on an unpaid leave, we send the musicians on the orchestra to play for people evacuated from their homes. Yeah. South and from the north. And they did, uh, the orchestra did uh, uh, basically 90 concerts during these, uh, during these three months to evacuate people. And you could see that a big part of the music that these people wanted to hear was Arabic music, was the songs that they like from home. 
I get it. And can I, Giacomo? I want to go back to the to the choosing teams thing. Go go. And I, for me, it's really I, I am I do try to advocate for complexity in these days because I think we're giving ourselves all the time. We have given ourselves too much of a discount for a long time. We have reduced any discourse into a tweet. And that yeah. means we, are, we have gotten used to having like black or white opinions and something sensational that fits into a, a tweet. But you know what? Newsflash. Life is much more it's complex than that. <laughs> exactly. Life is much more complex than that. And it's a, right. it's a, it's a spectrum of grays. And we have to uh, evolve and we have to become adults and not speak in emojis and start to speak in more complex ideas. It is okay to be pro-Palestinian and still against what Hamas did on October 7th. This complexity can be held by a human brain. It is okay to be with and in solidarity with the Israeli victims of the Hamas attack in October 7th while having criticism over actions of the Israeli government. A human brain can and should hold this kind of complexity. So I'm I'm really annoyed when we are giving ourselves all these discounts and by that helping the polarization more deepen more and more because we don't want to say anything that is too complex. We are human beings with humongous brains that give our mothers a lot of pain when she's trying to give birth to us because we have such big heads. Let's start using these heads. We are more complex beings than we have reduced ourselves to be in this era of really reducing every discourse so much that we want it to fit in 70 characters. Yeah. This discourse does not fit in 70 characters, people. And we have to open our minds and our, and our hearts and our brains and all our capacities in order to see that in order to go through this hell, we'll have to open up the discourse to a more complex idea. And yes, we'll have to uh, uh, hear narratives that we don't like hearing. I hear stuff that I don't like hearing every day, but I know that I have to stick in the room because this is what I believe in. I believe that we have to bridge between that. And you know what? You don't need to bridge when you with a friend. With a friend, you already have a bridge. It's yeah. usually with somebody on the other side that you need to build a bridge. So it's tough, it's hard. You don't think the same. You don't come from the same culture. You don't come from the the same belief system. You have been brainwashed all your life on both sides. Everybody's brainwashed somehow. People are brainwashed in on Facebook right now. So let's not even you know go into traditions. So we should open our eyes and know that we are all stuck inside little bubbles of ideas, and we should burst these bubbles and try to get to know what's happening on a bigger on the bigger side on the bigger level, you know, what other people, how other people are perceiving things, and maybe we can learn something. Mm -hmm. And songs can help, music can help. Always. Oh. Art can help, because art is there in order to evoke questions, in order to present a complexity. Art is always complex. There is nothing simplistic about art. If it's simplistic, it's a child painting maybe, but any yeah. art is, very, is a complex idea, should be yeah. a complex idea. Yeah. Yeah. It's amazing, guys. I would stay hours with you to talk about that, and maybe one day we will meet and we will discuss in front of glass of wine or a tea. But uh, I, I always promise myself to to make it maximum one hour. This pause uh, cafe, but we lost some minutes at the beginning, so yes, I that's went true. a bit. That's true. I, went, I went a bit further. Uh, I want to ask to Mira. Wait, no, I've got a, 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 a nice. Um, Roberto Micheletto says complexity, you can see that and speed push yeah. polarization. We should slow down in order to see the intense smell of the complexity. At the end of the days, we all know that the best perfumes are mix of oh, smell. Oh, wow. there you go. That's a nice Roberto, metaphor. Thank you, Roberto. Yeah. <laughs> a poet. And then my beautiful wife that says, oh. absolutely, Mira, 100% with you. Great. Oh. Amazing. Oh, yeah. And and uh, what i what i was wanted to ask you mira is which are your projects right now what are you working on Oof. first of all you know in this time i'm having trouble working on projects to tell you the truth i find myself very much distracted and uh and not being able to focus on a lot of things but i think this is a general disease for a lot of people i know right now 
but I'm, I'm using my voice where it's wanted. So I give my voice to, uh, to a lot of places that I'm invited to bring the message that I bring. And I use it either by singing or talking or listening. You know, also listening is a voice. Uh, I know it's a complex idea for you to, <laughs> but, uh, you know, but br be, being, uh, creating a space uh, for people to express themselves. Yeah. Me, me helping create a space for people to express themselves. That's also something that I've been doing a lot lately. Um, as a now, coach. Also as a coach, yes. And I'm, and I'm loving that because I think um, all these years of being on stage, and, and and engaging with audiences and creating and being creative have brought me to a wonderful place where today I can help other people express themselves mm -hmm. and their mm -hmm. stories. As you know, I'm also a storytelling consultant right now. So, and I'm writing a lot. And so all these things, um, you know, uh, have culminated into not me always being in, in the front which is a weird concept for an artist, for a performer. But yes, I don't always have to be in front. I can be also in the cycle of people, in, in the choir, you know, and mm -hmm. helping others sound their own voices. So that's what I'm doing right now. And I hope that, you know, when time when time will be right, I will, I will tell you what my sure, artistic okay. projects yes. are. <laughs> okay. And Tom, what about you? What are you working on? Which are your projects next future? concerts or maybe concert because it's i think it's a flow that never ends in your case no yeah well actually yeah we are now i'm now going back in two weeks when the vacation here finishes i'm going back uh, for a tour around israel uh, uh, with a singer called uh, shlomi shabbat we are doing kind of a homage to his uh, career and to his uh, songs uh, during the years uh, I'm planning to get to Morocco at the end of uh, this, just just beginning of this uh, summer, uh, for a few concerts, and then maybe again in September. So with going the, to with your Moroccan orchestra. My Moroccan orchestra, yeah, with Symphoniat. We have the Symphonia. Japan Festival East and West at the end of uh, at the end of August. Also struggling to see if we can get uh, a nice acts from abroad. Uh, coming to play hopefully for for uh, a bit more uh, cool days and uh, yeah as you said the, the work never stops at the factory of music great great to hear that guys it was such a pleasure to have you both to know you better because actually it's the first time that we can talk uh, well, one hour <laughs> without interruptions and without and seeing each other so I thank you very much. Tom, you disappeared. Tom disappeared. Tom, gone. <laughs> Tom wait, 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 let you go. What happened? <laughs> Don't leave oh, there before you I are. let you go. <laughs> <laughs> thank you so much for staying with us, for sharing your life, for sharing your content, for sharing your thoughts, because it's, it's something that uh, helps a lot during these times. And, and when you have special people, uh, it's very good to let them talk and to let them spread their, their ideas. I hope to see you again in real life, maybe soon, maybe later. And take care and good luck for everything. And Thank you, Giacomo. It was good seeing you, Tom. Good I hope night. to see you in life soon. So good take night. care, guys. And thank you for having me, Giacomo, again. It was a pleasure. Ciao, Tom. Ciao, ciao. I'll, I'll let you go out. Uh, Tom has no microphone <laughs> right now. So we cannot hear you. Ciao, guys. Ciao. I will remove you. Bye. Bye bye. Okay, thank you very much for your uh, attention. So there was a problem with Facebook at the beginning, and I think there is still a problem with Facebook. So we went only live on YouTube. There are some Wirtzman listening from Tel Aviv. Hello, Eyal. Nice to see you. Another Laricha from Rome. I can imagine Roberto Micheletto with another message thank you roberto and thank you all for listening and i will tell you good night and i will see you ci vediamo un'altra volta for another pausa cafe thank you bye have a good night bye